you for your service. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the President's budget request for the missile agency and missile defense policies in preparation for the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2025. We're working on that now. We're hoping the markup on that bill will be at the end of this month. So now's the time. In today's open hearing, I hope that we can address a number of issues. First and foremost is the defense against hypersonic missiles, which we seem woefully unprepared for. Woefully, that's an understatement. Second is the requirement to protect Guam against any threats that China may pose, a daunting task that integrates missile defense from the Army, Navy, and the Missile Defense Agency. The third issue is how today's threat landscape has changed the nature of integrated air and missile defense given the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East. Ukraine faces all forms of air threats, from drones to hypersonic missiles. Likewise, the recent events in the Middle East and Iran's April 14th attack included, included over 300 drones, crews, and ballistic missiles launched toward Israel. I realize much is classified, but it's important for the public to understand how today's missile defense landscape has radically changed in the last five years. The fiscal year 2025 President's budget request for Missile Defense Agency is $10.4 billion, a decrease from 2024 enacted budget of $10.8 billion. I would like to know how the fiscal year 2025 budget request continues your effort for homeland and regional missile defense as well as defense against hypersonic weapons. I understand that a mainstay of the Aegis destroyer, the SM-31B missile, was zeroed out this year. I need to understand the impacts of such a decision and the basis thereof. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for agreeing to appear today, and uh, we will have rounds of five-minute questions to the witnesses. Senator Rounds, uh, Senator Fisher is on her way. She'll be here shortly. She gave me permission to start. I have no doubt. Yeah, and but you know that I wouldn't have without that permission. Of course. So, Mr. Hill, are you the lead witness? Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Please proceed. <clears throat> Uh, Chairman King and Ranking Member Fisher and distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the topic of the President's missile defense budget. Uh, you have my full written statement. I ask that it be included in the record. Thank you. I want to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to this committee for your bipartisan approach and steadfast support of the Department's missile defense plans, programs, and posture to fulfill the nation's missile defense needs. I also want to acknowledge and express my appreciation for the crucial role this committee played in passing the National Security Supplemental, including the $60 billion for Ukraine. Conflicts around the globe continue to demonstrate the centrality of missiles in modern warfare and global strategy, and the indispensable role of integrated air and missile defenses in protecting military capabilities, civilian populations, and national sovereignty. Conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East likewise provide daily reminders of the indispensability of our alliances, and the national security imperative of standing with our allies around the world. To meet the challenges of missile defense, the President's fiscal year 2025 budget request includes $28.4 billion for missile defense and defeat. Key investments include $2.5 billion to develop the next generation interceptor for ground-based mid-course defense and to extend the service life of the current ground-based interceptors. $1.9 billion for ballistic and hypersonic defense programs, $4.7 billion for space-based missile warning systems, $1.5 billion for the Army and Missile Defense Agency for the development and procurement of the Guam defense system. These and other de investments in missile defenses and advanced early warning systems will continue to expand decision space for our military and civilian leaders preserve our forces' freedom of move, maneuver, and strengthen our integrated deterrence and overall defense posture. Keeping pace against rapidly evolving threats requires continued improvement in our active missile defenses, as well as pursuit of comprehensive missile defeat approaches to expand our response options. The department is prioritizing efforts across the entire engagement space to improve the probability 
of a successful intercept and improve the efficiency with which we conduct missile engagements and defeat missile threats. To achieve these goals, we are developing and fielding better sensors on Earth and in space that can provide higher fidelity warning, tracking, discrimination, and kill assessment data. The department is also putting a greater emphasis on non-kinetic missile defeat capabilities, including options in directed energy, electronic warfare, and cyber, which expand both right of launch and left of launch options against the evolving threats. In closing, thank you again to the committee for your partnership and for your tireless dedication to the department and our service members. Additionally, I want to thank each of you for your service to your constituents and to the nation. I look forward to answering your questions. Gentlemen, are you going to add to the testimony or simply take questions? General, I don't, I, I'd love to hear from you. Yes, sir. Uh, Chairman King uh, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's a high honor to command and represent the women and men of the North American Aerospace Defense Command and United States Central Command, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm pleased to appear alongside my friends, Lieutenant General Collins, Lieutenant General Ganey, and Dasty Hill. NORAD and NORTHCOM work very closely with each of them as we depend on the robust capabilities they provide that enable and empower our missile defense and other critical homeland defense missions. The United States and Canada face an extraordinarily complex strategic environment. Our competitors have fielded advanced ballistic and cruise missile systems designed to strike civilian and military uh, infrastructure in North America, both above and below the nuclear threshold. As an update to my previous testimony earlier this year before the Armed Services Committees, I am increasingly concerned by the expanded military cooperation and reported technology transfers between Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Further, Iran's direct attack against Israel on April 13th marked a strategic shift and clearly illustrates the continued need for integrated air and missile defense systems to defeat threats ranging from ballistic and cruise missiles to unmanned aerial systems. Layered domain awareness systems that detect threats from the seabed to space and defensive capabilities such as the next generation interceptor are critical to the Homeland Defense mission and remain key NORAD and NORTHCOM priorities. In addition to the missile threats, adversary cyber capabilities and emerging technologies such as small unmanned aerial systems present significant risk to North America critical infrastructure. NORTHCOM and CyberCOM defend the networks daily from adversary cyber attacks and incidents of small UAS operating inside the US and Canada near civilian and military infrastructure are increasing and require a timely and well-coordinated interagency response. The United States, in concert with global network of like-minded allies and partners, requires innovation and engagement across the entire spectrum of military, diplomacy, foreign aid, and strategic communication to counter our competitors' maligned influence and increasing capability to threaten North America. The active defense of North America requires NORAD and NORTHCOM to actively campaign in all domains and across all avenues of approach. The success of our missions relies on detecting potential threats far from our shores and quickly sharing critical information between combatant commands, conventional and special operations, the intelligence community, and the spectrum of interagency partners. That inter information flow cannot be overstated, and I strongly support the department's work to advance the combined joint all-domain command and control concept. The challenges facing our nation are real, but there should be no doubt about NORAD and NORTHCOM's resolve to deter aggression and, if necessary, defeat threats to our nations and our citizens. Again, thank you, sir, for the opportunity to appear this afternoon, and I look forward to your questions. Chairman King, Ranking Member Fisher, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I am honored to testify before you as the commander of the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command and Joint Force Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense, JIFIC IMD. In these roles, I am representing an incredible organization of 2,300 soldiers and civilians spanning 13 time zones in 19 locations worldwide. This one team of professionals tirelessly provides space, high altitude, and missile defense forces and advanced capability to Army and Joint Warfighters. I am honored to represent them, and I thank you for your unwavering support for this team and their families. I also serve as the senior commander for both 
uh, Fort Greeley, Alaska, and U.S. Army Garrison Kwajalein Atoll, two strategically important remote sites that are experiencing challenges with facilities that must be continued to be addressed as we move forward with more priority. Additionally, I also serve as the Army's lead enterprise integrator for air and missile defense, while my role as JIFIC IMD provides operational level missile defense and expertise and integrates trans-regional missile defense functions across the joint and combined warfighting force. As the Army's air and missile defense enterprise integrator, I will continue to use this role to highlight that the Army's air and missile defense remains the Army's most heavily deployed force with the highest demand signal amongst the combat commands every year. This high op tempo continues to provide a significant strain on our formations and families as we must continue to address their needs. As you know, the urgency for multi-domain trans-regional combat effects continues to increase exponentially. Our adversaries' air and missile-related threats have rapidly expanded in recent years in quantity, variety, and complexity. We see this today in Ukraine and looming on the horizon in the Pacific. It has never been more important imperative that we and our allies and partners enhance our missile defense and space capabilities to impose costs on our adversaries, denying them the benefit of using these weapons and ensuring the safeguard of our nation. As our adversaries increase their emphasis on space and missile capabilities, our U.S. Army must innovate and evolve. Understanding the challenges in today's threat environment, the Army released our space vision supporting multi-domain operations, specifying the Army's role in integrating space capabilities into joint and coalition operate, operations while also interdicting the space capabilities of our adversary. Therefore, we seize opportunities to integrate and exercise with other commands and coalition partners, remain fixed together, working in dominance in science and technology development, and persisting in gathering soldier proficiency in groundbreaking technology. It is also increasingly apparent that integrating our space operations and missile defense operations is critical to our national security. Our integration is essential to effectively contributing to strategic deterrence and responding in crisis. Today, we must integrate space and missile defense at every onset of prototyping, concept development, and application. As we do this all in concert with Army, Joint, and Coalition partners, one voice together around the globe. Our allies and partners are critical for layered and tiered options to degrade, disrupt, and defeat adversaries, share burden, integrate technology, and protect our mutual homelands. But all of these operational considerations pale in comparison to the will, determination, and trust of the amazing men and women that operate and sustain these advanced systems. We ask a lot of our Army AMD and space formations, and the demand will only increase in the future. Our plan for structure growth and modernization is critical in the coming years. Thank you for your efforts in supporting them with timely budgets, caring for them and their families, and building trust with the American people now and in the coming years. Caring for our soldiers and their families is paramount to win in any environment and globe. Thank you for supporting an incredible mission ready team. I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you. General Collins. Thank you, Chairman King, Ranking Member Fisher, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm honored for the opportunity today uh, to join uh, my colleagues on this panel uh, and uh, discuss a missile defense mission, and I appreciate your continued strong support of the missile defense mission over the years. To start, I'd like to thank the men and women behind the development, delivery, and sustainment of the missile defense system that I represent today, our MDA family, and the operators of the system, all are key partners in this no-fail mission. We are requesting $10.4 billion to develop and deploy homeland missile defenses and improve regional defenses against increasingly diverse and dangerous missile threats, a reality we all witnessed when Iranian and Houthi forces launched over 100 ballistic missiles in addition to cruise missiles and unmanned aerial vehicles against Israel last month. Our prioritization of decisions will maximize missile defense system capability, capacity, and readiness. We continue to work closely with the combatant commanders and services to help prepare them for the fight of today and tomorrow. To defend our homeland from ballistic missile attack, the ground-based mid-course defense system, or GMD, remains our nation's sole protection from limited attacks, with the primary focus being the advancing North Korean threat. The ongoing ground-based interceptor, or GBI, service life extension program 
will continue to improve GBI reliability and availability and will help mitigate risk until the next gen interceptor or NGI is fielded by the end of 2028. After 20 years, GMD stands ready. As shown in December of 2023, when we successfully executed a GMD intercept flight test using the two three-stage selectable ground-based interceptor in two-stage mode, demonstrating increased engagement battle space. We plan to deploy this capability to the entire fleet by the end of this year. The NGI program remains on track, and as this subcommittee is aware, we recently selected Lockheed Martin to continue uh, as, the, as the prime for NGI development, testing, production, and fielding. Soon we plan to add the long-range discrimination radar to MDA's operational capability baseline to enhance tracking discrimination and hit assessment against long-range missile threats. Today, LRDR is ready to support the Space Domain Awareness Mission. For regional defense, MDA continues to design improvements to the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense capability and procure the standard Missile 3 Block 2A missiles. We were very pleased with the performance of the Aegis weapon system and the system operators on board the USS Arleigh Burke and the USS Kearney and the role they played in intercepting the ballistic missiles fired against Israel last month. In fiscal year 2025, we will also test and deliver SPY-1 radar upgrades and support the Navy in future space domain awareness demonstrations. We will continue U.S. Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, interceptor procurement fielding and training support and collaboration with the U.S. Army to field the THAAD 4.0 capability to THAAD batteries by the end of 2025. THAAD 4.0 integrates Patriot capabilities with THAAD to increase Patriot defended area and engagement opportunities. We will also begin design work to improve the THAAD system to, to take on ever advancing regional threats. We will continue development of a 360 degree layered missile defense capability for Guam. MDA construction on the Joint Command Center, ANTPY-6 radar site, and launcher site will begin in fiscal year 2025. By the end of this year, we will execute a flight experiment against a medium-range ballistic missile target using an SM-3 Block 2A interceptor controlled by the initial Aegis Guam system using the first TPY-6 transportable array unit. Today, our sea-based terminal defenses protect assets at sea and forces ashore from hypersonic threats. Working with the Navy, we anticipate delivering follow-on increment three capabilities in fiscal year 2025. The Glide Phase Interceptor Program, or GPI weapon system, will enable a layered defense against hypersonic glide threats. By the end of fiscal year 2024, MDA will select a single GPI interceptor, design, uh, uh, interceptor designed to complete development. We will continue to develop and mature the GPI capability and support the planned cooperative development of the GPI with Japan. We launched the Hypersonic and Ballistic Tracking Space Sensor, or HBTSS prototype satellites in February of this year to demonstrate fire control solutions generated against hypersonic maneuvering threats from space. Following successful demonstration of HBTSS, the responsibility for fielding HBTSS-like fire control capabilities will be taken on by the U.S. Space Force. I'm honored by this opportunity. I greatly appreciate everything this committee does for Missile Defense Agency and the Missile Defense Mission, and I look forward to your questions. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and my apologies for being uh, late to this hearing. I came from another meeting. Welcome to all of our witnesses. We appreciate you appearing before us today, and we look forward to hearing from each of you. I am pleased to see progress being made on several programs over the last year, including continued development of the Missile Defense Agency's hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor layer and the next generation interceptor program. However, I remain concerned that we are moving far too slowly on developing defenses against hypersonic weapons. In section 1666 of last year's NDAA, this committee directed the department to achieve initial operational capability for the glide phase interceptor program not later than December 31st, 2029. Yet the Missile Defense Agency's budget requests included no funding for accelerating the development of the glide phase interceptor. Instead, it pushed out it, it pushed it out even further, and that's far too late. 
I'm also deeply concerned about the slow speed at which the department is addressing recovery efforts from the rogue wave that devastated facilities at the Reagan test site in the Marshall Islands. We cannot allow critical testing capabilities for our nuclear deterrent and other long-range missile systems to be undermined by too slow recovery. I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses about these issues and about how the FY25 request would impact their mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You all know me as a mild-mannered, reasonable guy, but I'm not going to be mild-mannered today. The truth is we have no defense for hypersonic missiles, yes or no? Mr. Hill, any defense on a hypersonic missile? You're the commander of an aircraft carrier in the, in the Greenland Gap. We have Hypersonic we have missile some. launched from Murmansk, 6,000 miles an hour. What do you do? We have some systems that defend in the terminal stage, but we need more. You're correct, Senator King and Senator Fisher, that our hypersonic defenses are inadequate, and we do need, but so SM-6 is, is in the Navy's terminal range. Patriot, I'll let General Ganey speak to the specifics on that. Those are examples, but no argument. We need, we need focus on hypersonic so defense. why are we talking about 2029 and even stretching that out? This is, this is next year kind of stuff. I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get your budget. What we, what we faced in this year and the budget this year, um, it was a very difficult year, with a, particularly with the Fiscal Responsibility Act caps that we had to work with. There, with the must-pay bills that had to go in for the personnel, the salaries, the health care, um, inflation costs. When you get down to the point of what was left for the discretionary types of things where you can really control your choices, you're focusing on trades between That's readiness. That's your mission. Your mission I, is missile defense. Yeah, there's readiness. Uh, the, the, the budget decisions at the aggregate level are made, at, made at, at a higher level, and so you're trading off between readiness or your future investments. Well, let me, ask, let me put the question another way. Let's say uh, what happened on April 14th happened in over the Arctic Ocean. 300, 300 missiles, drones, AU, a, AV, a, AVs came across the Arctic Ocean toward Canada and, the, and North America. Could we do what Israel and we and other countries did? Could we talk, knock down 99% of those missiles coming in if, if that had happened in, in the northern part of the world? If, if I may, that, that is in the realm of the responsibility of the commander, NORAD North, North, NORTHCOM. Okay, so could we have done what happened on April 14th? No, no Chairman. No, that, that's, that's of concern. Yes, sir, it is. What's, what's the gap? Is the gap interceptors? Is the gap sensors? What, what, how come they could do it over there and we can't do it here? Uh, part of the reason, Chairman, is, is because they have to deploy forces. So at the current time, uh, we have the capability uh, in, in the services, but they're, yes. they're not uh, assigned to the NORCOM AOR. Thank you. Uh now the uh, also the you know just the numbers of, of uh, assets that we have in, in the region right now would not be sufficient to to meet the the attack of, of that size that, that the uh, Iranian in fact we, we really have our our capability in the region is aimed toward North Korea, isn't that correct? That is correct. It's not, it's not designed to take on Russia or China, but that's where the, the threat is. What's the cost of one GBI? Sir, so the GBI is, is approximately 80 million, 85 million. One, one missile yes, sir. to intercept an incoming missile is $80 million. Is that yes, correct? Sir, for, yes, sir. For, uh, for, for an intercontinental ballistic missile class interceptor, uh, yes, sir. Well, in the Red Sea, the, the Houthis are sending twenty thousand dollar twenty thousand dollar drones, and we're shooting them off. We're shooting them down with missiles that cost four point three. The math doesn't work on that, gentlemen. I mean, it just doesn't work. What 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 are we thinking? Okay, here's what I'm getting at. Your budget for directed energy is one one thousandth of your total budget. It has gone down from $140 million a year to $15 million a year. What in the hell are you guys thinking? Directed energy is, is the answer. It costs 25 cents a shot. And the budget's gone down from $140 to $15 million a year. That's a scandal. You, you, you can't possibly, we can't possibly defend ourselves with $80 million missiles. There's not enough money in the whole world for that. 
Somebody give me an explanation of why, and I've got the data right here. In, 20, in 2018, $141.5 million for directed energy. FY25, 15.6. Senator King, uh, that is the portion of directed energy that is for the Missile Defense Agency across Isn't the that your business? <clears throat> the missile the, defense. Yeah, but th there's directed energy and they have part of the missile defense piece. A lot of the air, mis air defense, which is a lot of what air, uh, the directed energy supports, is actually done in, in the Army or in the Navy. There is about a little over $200 million in directed energy programs, but I take the point that that, that oh, is well may way, not be enough. The budget for the entire defense department for directed energy is also down by something yes. like two-thirds. And I just, I, I don't get it because we can't go on hitting bullets with bullets, with very expensive bullets. And particularly we're talking about very expensive bullets hitting very cheap drones. Directed energy can do that. We know it can do that. And I don't understand, it. That, that directed energy budget should be going, going like this instead of like this. But... Uh, Directed energy is a very important part. It has to be a very important part of missile defeat. Well, so I agree with you, but not... budgets are policy, Mr. Yeah. Secretary, and the, po the policy is directed energy ain't very important. Yeah. It goes from $140 million to fifteen. That doesn't tell me the department is valuing it very much. So I'll look forward to, to some further response because right now we don't have much missile defense. That's the truth. Whether it's to hypersonics, to drones, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like you guys to go back and really rethink what is your mission? Is your mission, if your mission is missile defense, we need to reorient what it is you do. Um, and someday you'll see me when I really mean it. Uh, Chairman, uh, Vice Chair, uh, go. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know. We all are. We all are. First of all, I would like to thank um, our military men who are here today. I thank you for the information you give us, not just at these open hearings, but at our classified briefings as well. Uh, you are open, you are honest about your needs. Uh, I will not put you on the spot here because you, you do uh, serve the Commander in Chief, you serve the Secretary of Defense, uh, Mr. Hill, uh, you're on the spot. Um, I thank you for the work you do too. But when, when is this administration going to listen to you and to listen to the expert um, advice and information that our military uh, gives them about what we need to defend the homeland? Uh, we hear from constituents who are angry because we aren't, um, we aren't protecting our southern border, that, that we have chaos at the border. Uh, we've just heard we have chaos everywhere when it comes to the security of our homeland. What is, what is it going to take? And don't, don't push it back, well, it's up, to, it's up to Congress to appropriate the money, it's up, it's up to uh, Congress to, to set it, because you're giving us your budget here and now. You are the ones presenting the budget with the advice of the military here with you. Um, it's, very, it's very upsetting knowing what we need and not being able to discuss it. So I thank you for your openness in this hearing and your answers in this hearing for what we need to have and I hope the American people are listening. With that, uh, General Collins. As I noted in my opening statement, this committee has uh, been very clear in our direction to accelerate the development of the glide phase interceptor system. And if provided with additional resources, what steps would you be able to take to meet the congressionally mandated initial operational capa uh, capability date of 2029? Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairman. As we, uh, as we talked about uh, just a second ago, the, the decisions, the resource decisions made put us in a tough spot and a tough decision on the GPI program. But if, if you had and what you needed, can you reach it? 
Uh, 29 will be a very hard, with, with the design of the system and the way the system set up and the tech, technology maturation that we have uh, playing out over the next four or five years, 2029 with the existing GPI plan uh, will, uh, will be a very hard uh, date to meet uh, as we move forward. Very, very, very high risk uh, program to do that. Uh, but we, in that section 1666, uh, we, we were tasked to come up with options and we are working with our industry partners, uh, with our service partners uh, for options within the GPI program and potentially outside the GPI program to bring capability to bear uh, against the hyperthonic threat. Uh, we will incorporate that uh, into that report and deliver that later this year uh, with option space and resource informed, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, General Ganey, I'm concerned that the Army is not appropriately prioritizing disaster recovery efforts um, for the Reagan test site. We, we know that it is uh, the linchpin of the development and testing of every long-range missile system of the United States, and we cannot afford further delays. So what can we expect to see um, or when can we expect it to see a disaster recovery plan from the SMDC? Ma'am, thank you for that question, and thank you for highlighting Kwajalein Atoll, a location, strategic location to our major, nation, and specifically in the Pacific. We have a great team out at Kwajalein. The team, Kwajalein, is doing amazing things, tight community, expertise in engineering, and in very important mission. We have moved significantly forward with the recovery ops. The challenge is not so much the recovery ops right now because we're able to continue testing and we will do, be able to perform our strategic testing. I'll personally be out there in June for one of our testing events that will occur. It's the long-term infrastructure challenges on Kwajalein that we have to address. Uh, the rogue wave just highlighted a significant issue that had been building up over years. And now we have to prioritize and address those infrastructure challenges as we move forward so we can provide the community for our uh, soldiers, civilians, engineers that are out there doing a critical mission uh, as you, we move forward. Do you have a, a plan in place right now to be able to address that? We have a plan, and we in the Army are looking at uh, command and control options, restructure options to more efficiently be able to get after uh, the challenges on Kwajalein. And also, we're looking at how can we do more at Kwajalein leveraging Indo-PACOM and USERPAC as part of that strategic location to help us build on that infrastructure out there to do more uh, for the Pacific than it's doing now. And that's how we're focusing from an integrated approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I call on Senator Rosen, I just want to assure you, my comments weren't in any way personal. You, you all are, are doing everything you can, but I think the agency needs to take a deep look at itself in light of what we've learned from Ukraine and from Israel and from developments in technology. Uh, drones have become ubiquitous just in the last three or four years, and that's, that's what I'm hoping to get across in a, in a somewhat intemperate way, but I wanted to make my point. Senator Rosen. Well, that's good because you actually set me up for my next question. So thank you. You didn't even know that. So thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member. Um, and I really want to thank you for serving. It is, uh, um, I guess, all times are challenging, but we're in an especially challenging time. And, and I want to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned from Iran's attack on Israel. So General Collins, um, the recent Iranian attack on Israel really did demonstrate how truly effective integrated air and missile defense systems can function to prevent large scale and a large scale and layered attack. More than 300 missiles and drones we know launched against Israel and an integrated system from numerous countries including Arab partners in the region were able to defeat the threat. So I have kind of a multi-part question. So General, what lessons can, have we learned from the attack and really how complicated how complicated is it to establish a system that's able to foil the attack? How vulnerable is an integrated air and missile system to cyber attack, if, as we talk about being with multiple countries? And of course, are you budgeting for this in the future? Because as we said, the budget is the blueprint. We see what's happened. And so 
how, do we, how do we have to rethink that? So I know it's kind of, uh, we bundled a bunch there, but. Uh, um. Thank you, Senator, uh, for that question. And it's a really important question. Integrated air and missile defense, uh, as we've seen in Ukraine, as we see uh, in Israel, uh, the adversaries are throwing integrated air and missile offenses at us. Uh, we really do need to make sure that we're integrated air and missile defenses in place uh, to defeat those. Um, and, and it's a combination of a lot of different players. Um, you know, the missile defense agency's main threat space is ballistic and hypersonic missiles. Um, uh, the services pick up the AMD, the integrated I AMD mm -hmm. for air and cruise missile threats. And then we do need to bring all of those together with our coalition partners to bring that together. Because right, our DEFEND Act, we passed a few years ago, my DEFEND Act created this integrated air and missile defense that clearly worked. Absolutely, absolutely, and it, and it worked very well. But it took a long, it takes a long time to make it work right. Uh, and General Ganey in his opening comments uh, made some uh, assertions about how much training and exercising and work we've done across the services and with our international partners to be able to demonstrate what, what, what happened that night. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will take the architecture, uh, the test and training, and the partnership uh, to really bring true IMD to the, to the forefront. It doesn't have, it, it, it may have looked easy. It wasn't easy to get there. It took a long time to get to what we demonstrated that night. Uh, and as part of that architecting, as part of that development, as part of the testing to do that, cyber has to be uh, at the ground floor of any of these concepts as we move forward. Uh, within the missile defense system, we have a, a, a comprehensive cyber test program mm -hmm. from the element up through the system before we get to the, to the field, as well as uh, looking to do cyber defense while in the field. That has got to be foundational to everything we do in the future, because that will be absolutely critical. If, if the enemy gets inside the IMD, right. then the IMD is, 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 is unsuccessful. To remember uh, the last part, your last. Are part you of your are you forward thinking and forward budgeting? The budget is the blueprint, so we see that the what everyone is using, what the chairman, ranking member have been talking about. How are you thinking about this for future budgets? What are you letting us know that we can put as a placeholder, develop, you name it? We have to take care of it. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. I'll answer one and then hand it to, to, to General Ganey. But yeah. for one thing is, uh, as at Missile Defense Agency, we have the, the technical authority for IAMD, the, the technical design for the architecture. And we have spent a lot of time over a decade working on uh, a future joint tactical integrated fire control architecture with the services and we are demonstrating the future capability of the how The future to, is now, I'm afraid. Uh, and we just recently at uh, Project Convergence, uh, Capstone 4 uh, with the Army, uh, demonstrated where we connected uh, many assets from all the services together through uh, a demonstration of this joint yeah. uh, tactical management capability. And we passed measurement level data between an F-35 to a sea shooter. And the, mm -hmm. the sea shooter took a shot using F-35 Threat data. data. That's great. So we are continuing to move that forward. That is that is an effort that's near and dear to me to push this integrated forward. I'll hand over to General Ganey with some thoughts. Yes, ma'am, and thanks for your question. Thanks for the opportunity to be able to respond. From an Army perspective, I wear the Army hat, but also wear the Joint hat with Chifik mm -hmm. IMD also. But looking at the lessons learned, I wanted to highlight earlier that we possess the capability uh, to defeat a threat that we saw uh, on April 14th. The work we've done uh, with our partners uh, and the work we've done from a joint perspective mm -hmm. has helped us and that was put on showcase on the 14th. The way the Army is moving forward with our modernization, right now Patriot system is our cornerstone system. However, as we modernize with IBCS and, and we've asked for funding, we're getting funding to be able to do that, we are now gonna move to a more of a layered, tailored approach to the threat. So if we get a a threat uh, strike like we saw on the 14th, we will be able to tailor to be able to provide tactical ballistic capability or cruise missile capability or even drone capability within that tailored force by the way we're budgeting, modernizing our capability moving forward. So I'm fully comfortable that the Army is taking those lessons learned and validates our path forward in modernization as an Army. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Senator, Senator Rounds. Uh, if you look right now at the uh, cut. Nope. Try again. It's not working. 
I'll tell you, is it working now? Now you pressed it, mine comes on. Because <laughs> I, thought, I thought I turned mine off. Oh, mine's on too. There. That'll work. Let me begin, uh, General Gio, um, you, you, based on our approach right now, we have moved back into a near-peer competitor mode where we have two near-peers. Um, if you have to lay out for the American people what you see as the greatest threats that you have to, f have to defend against right now, uh, share with me the vectors that you see these offensive weapons coming in us. What, what are the weapons that we're defending against today and that you're working on? S Senator, the, the, the range of weapons is, is greater than it's been at any time in the past. So uh, starting with the, the North Korean threat and the intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, would, is probably the, the longest range threat that I look at each day. Uh, next would be the uh, cruise missile threats that are not only air-launched cruise missiles from uh, Soviet bombers, uh, but also submarine-launched ballistic missiles uh, that can come from either uh, coast uh, if the uh, adversary uh, submarines get, get close enough. Um, and the cyber threat. The cyber threat is, is the most present and persistent threat that, that we see. We see it on a daily basis, uh, uh, attacks from nation states and, and uh, hacktivists uh, trying to get into our, our systems each day. What about drones? Drones are a, uh, uh, certainly an increasing threat. We see them um, on average reported that, that are detected in the NORTHCOM AOR is anywhere from two to five a week over uh, installations, uh, military installations. Uh, that's the only visibility I have, but I, you know, I know there's certainly more over other parts of uh, critical infrastructure. Fair, fair to say that our defense of the North American continent really has been based upon having the equipment to defend against the ICBM, number one, and to a lesser degree, the cruise missile, but, not, but until recently, not a lot on drones because they're new, and not a lot with regard to cyber, except that which has moved through the system in the last three, four years? Senator, I think that's accurate. If you take a look at the, the, the systems that we use to defend against them, th these are very expensive weapon systems, aren't they? The, the ICBM, the cruise missiles, and so forth are expensive. And really, the, 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 the equipment that we're using, uh, our ability to shoot them down is with expensive systems, as the chairman identified. But what we're really talking about here is, is with regard to ICBMs and cruise missiles, we're probably going to spend an expensive piece of machinery to catch up with them and take them out. But on what we're seeing coming across in the Middle East right now and in the Red Sea area, we're talking about not just, we're not really talking really about a lot of ICBMs, but we are talking about cruise missiles. And we're talking about a huge number of, of drones. We're using weapons that were never made to take those out. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, uh, yes, it is, Senator. I think the, uh, to, to uh, characterize what you said, we are using uh, expensive weapons on UAVs and into the cruise missiles. Uh, I think that directed energy, uh, I think that uh, laser high power microwave capabilities, certainly for the UAVs, and even would have some capability against cruise missiles. But the, but the problem, as I understand it, is that we haven't made that move yet. We haven't moved, and, and this is where I'm going to move from what the threat is there over to General Collins here for just a second. The systems that you work on today are principally uh, equipment that, as the chairman's indicated, are going to be some very expensive responses to take out ICBMs and uh, cruise missiles. Is that an accurate statement, sir? Uh, sir, we, uh, we, our systems are designed against ballistic missiles, uh, against ICBMs, but also intermediate range, medium range, and short range ballistic missiles. So uh, the Aegis standard missile fleet, uh, THAAD, those are also designed for regional uh, area defense, 
uh, against theater ballistic missile class weapons. Uh, we do not uh, cover down on cruise missiles. What's the least expensive um, missile defense system aboard an Aegis carrier um, or a Patriot system? What's the least expensive actual uh, targeting material we've got what, what, per shot? Senator, if, if you're talking Army air and missile defense systems right now, it, it, it's probably our stinger. But, and this was what I want to clarify here, the Joint Counter UAS Office is working the uh, counter UAS threat. And we have systems specifically developed for the counter UAS, specifically the Coyote Interceptor, which is a significantly cheaper interceptor than a Patriot or an SM-2 type interceptor, and we are using that capability successfully in theater right now, and that's what we're using to address that threat. And, and that organization is continuing to develop technology, work with our industry partners. We've also been successful with directed energy, and we're also in the Army are filling a platoon of high-powered microwave capability that will eventually be able to be deployed, which will continue to bring down the cost curve. So the Army is really investing in directed energy, whether it's laser or high-powered microwave, and actually feeling it to the formation. So we have a directed energy 50-kilowatt striker fielded to 460th ADA uh, in support of 1st Armored Division, and we're fielding a platoon of uh, high-powered microwave to 151 ADA supporting first MDTF. So those systems are real and out in formations right now, and some of them deployed. And just to follow up on, because this is the part that I think the chairman was trying to make was, is do you have enough in the budget right now to push those particular systems? And have they been budgeted for, or do you need your budgets improved to take advantage of those weapon systems? I, I would definitely say we need to have more based off of the threat and the numbers of threats that we're seeing will we'll definitely How many of those weapon systems do you have today? Total numbers? Yep. Uh, I, I can give you that uh, number uh, outside of this forum. Classified? Yes, I can provide you those numbers because I don't is it, 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 it is uh, still in the, in the development field though? It, no, no that, that capability, it's, it's uh, Prototype, it hasn't gone to a full rate production program of record yet, but it is about to in the next two uh, fiscal years. Because what the Army is doing, we're taking that capability and we're, we're putting it inside of our division. So the first division set with the counter U.S. capability is being fielded now, first two divisions. And the third division will start fielding in FY26 where we'll actually have Coyote-based strikers with that capability on strikers. So the Army is moving forward as a program of record with this capability. It's not there now, but we are moving forward with it. One, one last question, just directed back to General Gill. Are you incorporating those into North American Defense Command today? We've requested to, Senator. When you say you've requested to, what's the hold up on it? Well, uh, let me be clear. We haven't requested coyotes because of the kinetic capability in the in the homeland, but we have requested uh, non-kinetic capabilities and directed energy uh, weapons for counter UAS. You've requested them. That's right. So the first one, Senator, as as uh, General Ganey mentioned, were pushed over to the AOR, where uh, the CENTCOM area of responsibility. So we're watching closely the uh, the effectiveness there, and then as they learn. Uh, and the, the, the system's proven, that's what I would like to employ here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Mr. Mr. Cotton, Senator Cotton. You know, as, as I sit here and I listen to all this conversation about all the threats we face and all the inadequacies uh, against those threats, it's great to hear all this talk of interceptors and directed energy systems. Um, I can't help but think maybe the easiest way to defend against all these missiles and drones would be to blow them up on the ground before they ever get off in warehouses or their assembly lines. Um, and I know you all have, in your, I know none of you are in charge of these decisions, you all have in your title missile defense and air defense and space defense and all the rest. But I, I think under President Biden, the Department of Defense may take its name a, li a bit too literally. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Yemen, for instance, all we're doing is shooting down missiles and drones that are in the air coming at our sailors or on the launch pad, ready to launch, we're not actually trying to destroy all of their capabilities. I understand there are reasons for that, um, that we can't necessarily 
find and fix them all right now, but that's a problem in its own right. So be much better to get on offense as a good defense rather than have our sailors as sitting ducks, like so many of our troops around the region are sitting ducks. Speaking of sitting ducks, uh, General Ganey, uh, do you believe that the Army is providing adequate authority uh, in a timely manner to units to defend against drone attacks or surveillance? Senator, thank you uh, for that question. In CENTCOM AOR, yes. Uh, the the great work that the, the great work that has been done inside of CENTCOM has really set the stage to have globally relook the way we push authorities down. But that's obviously centered, as you know, because it's a conflict area, and, and you have to and missiles are being shot at our soldiers, so they have to have that authority delegated down. Authorities in CONUS are a little bit more challenging, and uh, uh, what about in PACOM? That's, that's within the Area Air Defense Commander's uh, purview on how he delegates his authorities down to the uh, actual operator to be able to uh, shoot his capability. And he retains that authority based off of the risk analysis that he's doing. He has the ability to, to pass that authority all the way down to the operator level, but he chooses to withhold it now, which is in his authority. What about in Guam? Well, same thing. Because of the Area Air Defense Commander, uh, inside of uh, Indo-PACOM is the uh, PACAF commander. He also decides the uh, authorities that are delegated to Guam, and he has the authority to delegate them down further if he chooses to. It's my understanding that we've got a, quite, a, quite a few drones flying over our installations on Guam, and there's been no genuine response. Is that the case? I'm not tracking no general response. It may be a challenge with where the capability is located on Guam because uh, most of the counter U.S. capability is localized, and I'm, I'm not sure of the situation of how it's spread across. Who would have the authority to engage drones over Guam? It would be the local commander. Uh, we delegate the authority uh, for drones to the local commander on that site just because of the time and space you have to be able to delegate it to. So any discussions on delegation of authorities down even further to the operator would reside on Guam. Okay. Well, we're on the topic of Guam, General Ganey, and maybe General Collins as well, if you want to chime in. Um, what's the status of the environmental impact statements for the 20 Guam defense systems uh, sites? As far as the impact statement, I'll pass that to the Missile Defense Agency who's doing the impact statements. Yes, sir. We're, we're still in the middle of the environmental impact uh, uh, survey uh, process. Uh, we are, our very first set of MILCON, uh, military construction money, is in the fiscal year 2025. Uh, and so right now that, in, uh, that EIS schedule is on critical path, uh, but we are on track uh, to, uh, to be able to award those MILCON contracts on schedule uh, at the beginning of 2025. You said you're uh, in process. When did that process begin? Uh, well before me, probably a, a, over a year and a half, uh, two years ago is when the process starts. So 18 to 24 months ago, and it won't be finished for another seven months at least? Sure. Well, that's bad for like a pipeline or a road, but that seems especially bad for air defense systems on one of our most critical forward deployed bases in PACOM. That's all. Bad. In a moment. Yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. We will have a sec. We will have a second round. Yes, we will have a second round. Um, gentlemen, here, here's my problem, and I realize this isn't at your level. This is Secretary of Defense, President, but a high level of, of essentially allocation of resources. My problem is that Defense Department generally research and development and construction of directed energy has fallen by 50% in the last three years. One point, a little over 1.6 billion to uh, a little under 800 million. Uh, each of the services, the Army in those three years has fallen from 750 million to 150 million. That's a pretty dramatic decrease. My point is, this is a major policy discussion, and we need to have it on our committee, but I believe your agency has to have it as well. As I said before, what we've seen in the Middle East and what we've seen in Ukraine, it seems to me should cause some soul searching within an agency whose name is missile defense. Could we 
have done what the Israelis and the and we and and the Arab countries did on on April 14th and if the answer to that question is no then we really have to go back and rethink and we're talking again we're talking about 80 million dollar interceptors for ICBMs when in fact the more likely attack is going to come from air launch cruise missiles sea launch missiles in the in the in the Arctic Ocean um, you know I, I Sir Isaac Newton can tell you where an ICBM is going to go but where a cruise missile, particularly a hypersonic cruise missile, is going to go is a very different problem that requires a very different solution, and economics also has to be part of it. So uh, I just, I really believe that we need to have a department-wide, and frankly, on this committee, we have to have a discussion <coughs> about wh where we're going because budgets are policy. And we can talk about research and everything else, but if the budget's been cut in half, that tells me that this is not a priority for the administration or for the Department of Defense. So that's 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 my comment. And uh, when a budget's cut in half, that just tells me it's not very important. Senator, Senator Fisher. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hill, in the FY25 budget request, the Missile Defense Agency requested $1.2 billion for the defense of Guam. How would these funds be used to build out Guam's integrated air and missile defense architecture? So we have um, initially um, the, the missile defense funds complement as well with the Army program. The Army uh, is, is fielding um, programs, uh, and General Ganey can comment more detail that, on the missile defense part in particular. Uh, <clears throat> there is a focus on, um, it's not the, the same as Aegis Ashore, but using some of the launchers, the vertical launchers uh, that are of that type, and you also have radar uh, systems. I probably should refer to General Collins, for more specifics on that program, though, if I so may. So are, are you coordinating um, not just with the Army, the but with other partners as well? The overall coordination for the Guam, the acquisition, is actually an Army office. The Congress uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> wanted us to designate. We did. We designated the Army to lead that uh, rather than leading it from within an OSD office. And, uh, so that's why I would... Um, and, and, of course, that office is coordinating what Missile Defense Agency is doing and what Army, as well as what Navy is doing. Okay. Thank you. Rosen. Thank you. Well, I had some questions on Guam, too, so I'm just going to uh, kind of make a comment because we know the Chinese military has been so provocative in their plans to attack Guam. They've gone as far as releasing that commercial in September of 2020 of their Air Force using their H-6 bomber to attack the island and the U.S. forces. So along with everyone else, um, just want to be sure we're taking the adequate measures to deter our adversaries like China uh, to secure Guam against the similar vulnerabilities that we've seen um, in the past, particularly as we even go back to 1940 with uh, 41, excuse me, Pearl Harbor. So um, how are you positioning things? Senator Rosen, um, sometimes Chinese metal messaging isn't very subtle, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> um, what we did in the Missile Defense Review in 2022 uh, was made a very clear statement that we wanted people to understand, yeah, we can see China, you understand Guam is a very strategically important piece of the region. Uh, in the Missile Defense Review, we made a clear statement, it is also part of the homeland of the United States. That's right. Those are American citizens on Guam, they have been since 1950. So uh, we want you to understand that you're not just talking about any, any rock out in the Pacific. That's the United States. So that's part of the deterrence message in, with respect to China. We've also always had the, the challenge of it's been within range of North Korean missiles, and that's why you have THAAD batteries there today. Um, but as you're looking at that future larger question of war in the, in the Indo-Pacific or deterring war in the Indo-Pacific yeah. over Taiwan, um, this is where you're also trying to say the ability to project power from Guam is part of integrated deterrence and the ability to assure that power projection from Guam um, because you have right. missile defense to defend that power projection is a part of the overall architecture that, that is meant to deter really at the conventional level 
Thank you. And that brings me to my last question, which is implementing the National Security Supplemental, because, well, there's the Indo-Pacific, and if, certainly there is uh, um, Israel. And so I'm going to um, just really at focus on Israel right now. Um, we had $4 billion for Iron Dome, David Sling, $1.2 billion for Iron Beam, which is Israel's directed energy missile defense system. So General Collins, how are we working to get the funds from the supplemental out the door and spent uh, with interceptors ready to be sent over to Israel so that they can defend themselves? And could you update us on uh, implementation in general? Yes, Senator. Uh, great question and, and something that we're, uh, we're very, uh, we've done a lot of homework ahead of time as we, uh, as the, as the supple, supplemental went through the process, uh, we're going to follow the same process we followed a couple years back when there was the billion dollar Iron Dome supplemental mm -hmm. in 2022 mm -hmm. uh, through a, for, a process called exchange of letters. And those letters are drafted. Those are now uh, with the supplemental approval. Now we're taking those through final approval through, uh, through all the government agencies that need to approve it. Uh, and I, I don't have a timeline exactly yet of when that is expected to happen, uh, but those are in work, and uh, we've had from all the different agencies, state, De Department mm -hmm. of Defense, everybody, they've all been in and very cooperative, making sure we can get through this. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, final question. Why don't we have Iron Dome? We help pay for it. We help design it. Why don't we have an Iron Dome system uh, throughout the country, it doesn't seem to be terribly expensive. It seems to be it's, it's proven to be fabulously e effective. Why isn't that part of our arsenal, sir? sir I, I think I'll start just once before I hand over to, to, to General Ganey, sir. Just uh, in our uh, cooperative agreements with Israel, we we did not pay for the co-development of Iron Dome. We we co-produce Iron Dome, uh, so we were actually not part of the design phase for Iron Dome. We were for David Sling and Arrow Weapon System as we go forward. Uh, just wanted to clarify on uh, the background there, uh, General Ganey, as far as uh, utility. Yes, yes, Senator. Thanks for that question. Yeah, well, actually, we did have uh, Iron Dome for a period of time before we. Uh, provided it back to Israel on loan for the recent conflict. So it was in one of our formations, 15180A, who actually trained with it, uh, deployed it, and uh, exercised it. Our, but it can't it be reproduced? I mean, it, it probably can, but we in the Army, our strategy is not so much a system. As I highlighted, the Integrated Battle Command System, which is a C2 system that integrates several launchers with uh, several intercept, uh, several uh, sensors to provide the optimal uh, is it, solution. Is, is, your, is the system you're describing as effective as Iron Dome? It, it tested out just as effective. So as we implemented and filled it in our formations, we will field just launchers and not a complete system, which will provide the same capability because it will leverage the sensors that are already in those formations to provide a tailorable for, uh, uh, integrated solution for our Army. Well, I want to thank you again. Uh, today, and we've talked about a number of issues. I hope to reconvene this hearing in a classified setting maybe several months from now because I'd like to discuss hypersonic defense because to talk about missile defense without realistically talking about hypersonic defense is, is <clears throat> not taking cognizance of the world that we live in. But again, I want to thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a very informative, and thank you for the work that you're doing on behalf of our country. Hearing is adjourned. Thank you.